We're literally in the final days of the 2024 presidential race. What will the voters decide? How will healthcare matter in the race? And what will the outcome mean to each of us? I've spoken with, uh, or at least um, seen that there are other physicians who are Republicans who are kind of hedging or at least uh, shifting their views a little bit in terms of how they speak about abortion. And I think that may not be just physicians. I think that's probably across the board that people who are running in maybe more purple states especially may be more careful. We're convening our Reporters Roundtable to talk with the journalists who are covering the health policy and politics of this nail-biting race. They are Shannon Firth, MedPage Today's correspondent in Washington, and Sarah Overmall, who reports on federal issues for Stat News. That people generally do when they're asked the question of limiting abortion access, they will side with access, with, of course, you know, some, some restrictions or conditions on that. This is Conversations on Healthcare. Well, welcome to both of you and, uh, and to Conversations on Healthcare. Let's start off by discussing a Newsweek poll that showed abortion has overtaken immigration as the second most important issue for voters heading into November. And I'm wondering, Shannon, you interviewed an OBGYN who's running for the U.S. House in Minnesota as a Democrat. What did you learn from that story and the political consequences for other races? Yes, thank you so much again for having me here on uh, Conversations on Healthcare. I interviewed Dr. Kelly Morrison, uh, who is running in Minnesota. She's a state, she's been in the state legislature for a few years now. She's running um, for the open seat in Minnesota. She is very pro abortion rights. Um, she is very concerned about her colleagues around the country who have been impacted by abortion bans. She says it's absurd that physicians have to contact legal counsel in emergency situations to try to make decisions about the best care for patients um, while you know trying to keep themselves and their hospital out of trouble. Um, she's also done a lot of work to try to, uh, I guess one of the things that I asked her was if you cannot reinstate Roe versus Wade, if there aren't the votes in Congress, if say you are elected, I asked her, you know, what are other measures? And she pointed to the military and just said, it's really important to make sure that we follow their lead in terms of trying to help people access care wherever they can get it. Um, so she's, again, she's been, um, Passing forward, she's helped Minnesota pass protections in her state. Of course, Tim Walz is governor of Minnesota, um, is the VP candidate uh, right now. So I think she is really, uh, she, she would be a very strong voice for abortion rights if she were elected. Shannon, I heard uh, the other day that Liz Cheney was talking, a pro-life uh, person who was talking about this issue of of the confusion that it's caused in terms of the healthcare delivery for both uh, pro, pro-life, pro-choice uh, women across the country. Maybe talk a little bit about, uh, you know, uh, that view that's rising up in the campaign and probably one of the reasons that's moved this issue up uh, past immigration. Yeah, I think it's really interesting to hear people like Liz Cheney, who is um, a anti-abortion uh, policy person um, and has been a really strong voice in the conservative movement. Talk about we need to make sure that, you know, miscarriage management is is available and that we're not restricting all kinds of care here. Um, so I I mean, and of course, as we know, Liz Cheney supports Kamala Harris. And I think also I've spoken with uh, or at least um, seen that there are other physicians who are Republicans who are kind of hedging or at least uh, shifting their views a little bit in terms of how they speak about abortion. And I think that may not be just physicians. I think that's probably across the board that people who are running in maybe more purple states, especially may be more careful about how they speak about abortion, recognizing how um, you know, public consensus, public opinion feels about this issue. 
Well, Sarah, you recently traveled to Montana, which is one of 10 states with an abortion rights referendum on the ballot. What did voters that you talked to on the ground uh, tell you? And how do you think this sentiment could uh, affect the Senate race there? Yeah. So as you said, there's 10 states voting on it this year. And overwhelmingly, those states are voting on ensuring access to abortion, with the exception that Nebraska has two opposing ballot measures in front of them, one that would ensure access, one that would limit. Um, and what I what I found in Montana is what we're hearing in general in, in different states in this election and in the prior ballot measures that have been passed in other states that people generally do when they're asked the question of limiting abortion access, they will side with access with, of course, you know, some some restrictions or conditions on that. And so that's the confidence that a good amount of people have in Montana, that that's the way that it's going to go, but not the same confidence in the Democratic Senate candidate. Um, he is lagging the polls, John Tester. Mm -hmm. And look at this and, and look at other states that have kind of the same narrative going on. Arizona and Florida also have abortion ballots in front of them and also will probably elect Republicans if we're looking at the polls, but could still side with abortion rights. And so it's this sort of dichotomy where people, people know that this is what they feel they don't want those restrictions, as Shannon was talking about with Liz Cheney, for instance, there's there's different nuances here that people don't want to see put into their health care, but their political identities are still their political identities. So I think that we can safely assume at this point that Republicans will have control of the Senate, just that these states might be also ensuring abortion access in their states. And I, I would say just one more thing there. 10 states are voting on this this year. It's the most since Roe fell, but there are not very many states left that have this mechanism in front of them to have a ballot initiative before mm -hmm. their voters. So this is the last time really that we are going to see uh -huh. this amount of states voting on that. And really the two swing states are Nevada and Arizona where it's on uh, of the 10, uh, but um, any impact, we see that the Texas race is close they passed a very uh, restrictive uh, policy there. Uh, I'm not sure what's driving those numbers, but uh, uh, Cruz is ahead, I think, by just a few points. I'm not, haven't followed it as of today, but it seems to be a close race. Any, any thought that uh, uh, this issue's uh, resonating there? I think that's Democrats hope for sure. And as you said, this has moved up in polls as a primary issue for people. That's very important to Democrats to raise the stakes and to make to remind people that women's health care is on the ballot, essentially. And that's, I think, why Vice President Harris was in Texas last week. I think her her campaign surrogates were pretty clear that they don't think she might win Texas, right. but that she's in this backdrop of a state with a ban, and she can really draw attention to that there. And she did. And I think that's going to be um, something that we're going to just see so much of in this next week and a half or, or how much that we have in front of us, um, just raise, raising the stakes, sharpening what the arguments are here. There's uh, diametrically opposite views in many areas of this election, and certainly that's true of issues surrounding the Affordable Care Act which right now includes enhanced subsidies for low and middle income people on the health insurance exchanges, which I think has been very popular. These subsidies are set to expire next year if former President Trump and the Republicans uh, take control. What do you foresee this really meaning for the Affordable Care Act? Well, it's a big part of what the enrollment numbers have been in the Affordable Care Act lately. So, you know, the Biden administration has touted record numbers of enrollment, record numbers of coverage over these last few years. And a, a very big part of that is those subsidies that the, they keep costs low for many people. With them set to expire in 2025, there's sort of this dilemma in front of everyone, especially Republicans, where a lot of the people who benefit from those subsidies are in conservative states mm -hmm. and in states that have not expanded Medicaid. And so if those subsidies end, a lot of people who are going to feel that are conservative state voters. And so, you know, there's discussion of how we make those subsidies different. Essentially, we've we've heard from a lot of um, people who were former Trump administration officials or who are associated with the campaign these days about how those subsidies look different, how we apply them differently, how we separate risk pools in insurance and, you know, let healthier people have lower costs. Um, that's 
there's a lot there that Trump himself has not gotten into. He has not talked specifically about this. So we can only rely on what people around him have said. But he has assured us that he's not going to repeal ACA. He's just looking at basically every option that's in front of him. Interesting. Sarah, you, you reported on the slogan used by some Republicans. It says, make America healthy again. Uh, but it has an anti-science and anti-vaccine uh, bent to it. I wonder if you could take our listeners through uh, the, the Republicans' approach and, and, and maybe shine a light on who's behind it. Yeah, so Make America Healthy Again, obvious parallels to Make America Great Again, um, intentional. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy is one of the main people behind this, and he has been closely associated with Trump, especially since he dropped out of the race himself. He's on Trump's transition team. Even this weekend, Trump was saying that he is committed to putting Kennedy in his administration somehow. Uh, there's many arms to the Make America Healthy Again movement. A lot of it has to do with food policy, uh, chronic illness illnesses, how to better manage chronic illnesses, but also a lot of it has to do with this idea that public health agencies are not always incentivized to make the right decisions for people because of pharmaceutical industry influence. And that's the part that has a lot of people nervous because, you know, there's Robert F. Kennedy himself has had anti-vaccine commentary in the past, and he said in re more recent months that that's not how he feels, but the record is there. And the way that he's discussing the pharmaceutical industry and the review that agencies like the Food and Drug Administration have of these drugs, we already have a confidence issue in the United States towards vaccines, towards treatments. And so it has a lot of people nervous about what he would do and who he would pick to be the people who oversee these very agencies. So I think it's a discussion that we're still going to see happen over the next few weeks. Trump has absolutely doubled down on Kennedy having some sort of role. But I'll note that he said that his first time that he got elected and Kennedy was not there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> we can have a little bit of a reality check here. And, and, and certainly, of course, Kennedy, if he was to be put up for any position like HHS secretary, that's a Senate confirmed position. So we don't think that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But could he be in the White House? Could he have a lot of influence? Absolutely. And if you looked at the uh, many of the authors, while they have uh, put some distance behind the 2025 project and uh, and the campaign, uh, would we be surprised not to see some of the folks on the who, who helped author some of the health sections, perhaps somewhere in the administration? I think that's a safe assumption. I mean, a lot of the authors of Project 2025 were former Trump officials, and I know that he has distanced himself from a lot of that, especially the health section, but he's not um, distance, distance himself entirely from that. I think that the main thing that he has said that he would not do is what was discussed in terms of abortion policy. There's other parts of that, especially the notions of reforming and restructuring public health agencies that I think that he has signaled he would be on board with some of that. And we can see that even with him associating with Kennedy and the Make America Healthy Again alliance. And mm -hmm. so I think that we can look at some of those authors and a lot of other former Trump officials and say, those people might be back. Mm -hmm. Remind me, uh, are, are the positions like the FDA and CDC coterminous with the president's or do they have an over overlapping, uh, mm -hmm. li like the Federal Reserve Board is not, not tied to the term of the president? What do we know about those other positions? They are not necessarily tied to the term of the president, but the president does have to say that they would, you know, want that person to continue in that role. And a, a good point there as well. CDC was not a Senate confirmed position. Right. This next year will be the first time. Mm -hmm. Shannon, you wrote an in-depth story about Donald Trump's health. Uh, we sort of hear about the health generally, but we don't hear a lot about specifics. What do we know when don't know about his physical and mental condition right now. And how does that compare to what uh, Kamala Harris has shared about her health? Yes, well, we know about Donald Trump's health. We've kind of learned over the years, uh, probably the first public report that I remember was Harold, Dr. Harold Bordstein talking 
<laughs> in his letter about Trump's excellent health, and as we know, that letter was dictated by Donald Trump himself, as Dr. Bornstein later revealed. But more recently, um, what we know about his health from White House reports while he was in office include that he's on certain medications. He takes a statin, um, ro rosuvastatin, or also known as Crestor for uh, its cholesterol cholesterol lowering drug. He takes Propatia for uh, hair loss, and he takes uh, another drug, uh, sorry, an ivermectin cream for his rosacea. I mean, those are all um, pretty, I would say, normal things. Mm -hmm. um, he did get COVID, and we know um, from reports in the New York Times that he really downplayed how much he'd been impacted by COVID. Um, there were reports from some officials close to him, familiar with his medical case at the time, that he they thought he might need to be put on a ventilator. Meanwhile, um, early on, he kind of uh, was very much saying that he was doing fine and um, that wasn't really the case. Uh, we also have a sense that maybe in 2019, when he took the sort of mystery trip to Walter Reed, we heard from a White House press secretary later on that that was most likely for, uh, she said that it was for a routine colonoscopy, which I guess Trump didn't really want people to know at the time. Um, that's never been confirmed. And then, of course, more most recently of all, we have the attempts on his life. Um, looking at those, we know that uh, very little, actually. We know that Ronnie Jackson released kind of the only real report on his health after that, basically saying um, the bullet uh grazed or bullets or pieces of bullet grazed his ear and that he had bleeding and swelling on his upper right ear. Um, he did get a, uh, um, he did get a CT scan. We, it was reported that he got a CT scan. We never saw full results from that, which mm -hmm. are important to know because, you know, uh, anything coming that close to your head at that, <laughs> that, um, with that amount of power could cause other issues. Um, and in terms of his mental health, um, Stad actually did a really great piece on um, that looked at analyzing his um, cognition, his basically his verbal abilities. Um, I think this was the second time they got experts to analyze his speech and notice that he um, was using shorter phrases, was more repetitive, um, had had a lot more digressions. Uh, as far as his mental health, that was looked at pretty closely um, by my patient day back when he was during his first administration, when he was first elected. There were calls by mental health professionals to say that he's basically has a serious mental illness and should not be um, in office. And uh, there were petitions. There was a lot of discussion around that. Um, for one disorder in particular, we interviewed Dr. Francis Allen, who is the um, person who defined the criteria, the DSM, uh, Diagnostic Statistics Manual, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> criteria for narcissistic personality disorder, which is something that people thought that he might have. And he said, no, he's, quote unquote, a world-class narcissist, but he does not have the actual mm -hmm. disorder. Um, and in terms of, I guess, other mental health and cognitive issues will, you know, I think everyone would like to know more about his, you know, the possibility that he has PTSD after two attempts now on his life yeah. in okay. just a short period. Um, I don't know if we're going to hear any more or get any more information from him about his, you know, a medical report from him. He promised one back in August. We haven't seen anything um, substantive since the uh, Ronnie Jackson memo, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Ronnie Jackson being his former White House physician who's now in the U.S. Congress. Any any uh, abnormal findings in um, uh, Vice President Harris's uh, medical record? Right. Kamala Harris, um, her physician, uh put out a report very recently said that there's basically no findings of significance. She has, you know, she takes medication for hives. She takes medication for allergies, very normal things. She's um, she wears contact lenses. She's 
very active and healthy and eats nutritious meals. Um, there wasn't anything that stood out in her, in her vitals. Um, she also, uh, she, her mother died of colon cancer. Um, wow. so that was one of the things that, uh, MedPage had actually asked the campaign, like, we'd love to know more about, you know, what's her health history as she had colonoscopy that uh, they have said, at all routine screenings uh, for all of her mammograms. So there isn't anything of note um, that came out of the, or that would be worrisome in terms of um, serving a term as a president that came out of her medical report. You know, you mentioned the word COVID, which we've not heard a lot about in the campaign. And yet, to maybe to both of you, uh, long COVID's had an enormous impact on so many people across the country. Many Americans want to have it in their rearview mirror at this point. But where do we stand in any conversation about COVID, uh, the potential for another pandemic to come, uh, our readiness for the continued muta mutations that are happening uh, with the virus, uh, what, what are you hearing? Or is it kind of all gone silent? <laughs> I think that, I mean, I'll, I think a lot will depend on this election in terms of pandemic preparedness. If, you know, if Republicans or Republican administration wants to deplete or reform the FDA, the CDC, I think it will be a lot more challenging to keep, um, you know, and I on COVID um, and on any other future pandemics. I also know that um, there was talk, I'm not sure if this is still the case, but there was talk uh, from Trump about getting rid of the office of a, the White House Office of Pandemic Preparedness, hmm. um, which I think um, a lot of physicians or a lot of infectious disease physicians in particular would be concerned about, given that the only reason we had some preparation to begin with is because of people uh, like Anthony Fauci um, and others thinking through years back um, the need to sort of get ready for this and sounding the alarm uh, years and decades earlier. Well, it's President uh, Obama uh, certainly made a point about that on a recent newscast about having spent so much energy in the White House developing the preparedness plan and didn't think it was particularly picked up subsequently, but I'm sure it still rests there in the archives, at least. Um, a question uh, for either of you, really. You know, when it comes down to it, so much of governing relates to the people who are in charge under the president. We're curious, who are the candidates uh, that you've identified uh, to lead the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services on both sides? You talked about uh, uh, Kennedy, uh, probably not. Uh, but who are the leading candidates and how public are they about expressing interest in the job right now? Is there any kind of lead candidates emerging? So I, I can I can jump in first. <laughs> uh, in, in terms of the last question, how public are they? Generally, that's not seen as a good thing. Um, it certainly isn't seen as a good thing with the with the Harris and Biden folks that someone would be publicly publicly campaigning. So they're being very careful about their interest. On the Trump side, I'd say it's more of the same too. They people's names are in the ring, but to be seen as going out and saying that you want this is just not it's. It's not seen well, um, but we can we can with both of them think of some of the people that have already been prominent, whether it's in the first Trump administration or in the Biden administration currently. So if we go Harris first, um, we can think of some of the people like, you know, uh, the CDC director right now, Mandy Cohen, or mm -hmm. like people who have been vetted before for a position and then didn't have it, like um, the New Mexico governor, uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham. Grisham. Um, and in the Trump administration, I would say it's a little bit also similar to that, that there will be people coming back who were there the first time around. We could even see someone like Scott Gottlieb, who was FDA director, mm -hmm. left on good terms with him, coming back around in some sort of position. And then we are seeing some people that I would say are openly campaigning for a job. So the former CDC director, Robert Redfield, has fully thrown his support behind the Make America Healthy Alliance. He's been talking on News Network is about it. He penned an op-ed in Newsweek about this. I could see that that is clearly vying for a position. And so, yeah, some familiar faces, I think, in both administrations would be background. 
I think uh, Sarah covered a lot of people, but in terms of the Harris administration, I I also have heard Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham, CDC Director Mandy Cohen. Um, Lujan Grisham has been really outspoken in terms of trying to um, speak out about abortion bans. Um, CDC Director, she's she had a lot of bipartisan support when she mm-hmm. came in. Mm-hmm. I think she's been really focused on building up public um, trust in public health again. Um, Vivek Murthy is a name that's been floated. I'm not sure that that would happen, but his name has been mentioned. Chiquita brooks um CMS director, and Andrea Palm, who's the deputy secretary of HHS, all have been mentioned. But again, I think um, maybe Mandy Cohen and uh, Luhan Grisham, who is actually, she officiated Kamala Harris's wedding. Or no, sorry. Other way around, Harris officiated her birth. <laughs> uh-huh. um, right. and, and on the Republican side, we hear names like Paul Mango, Bobby Jindal, Joe Grogan, um, Brian Blaze of the Paragon Health Institute, um, and then also Eric Cargan. Those have all been touted as possibilities. Again, RFK uh, could be in the mix. I, I again, with Sarah, feel like that confirmation hearing would be really interesting. Um I, but I do think that um, Trump once has said to, uh, I guess, whether I can't remember it was the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, but has said that he wants him somewhere in his cabinet. And whether that's FDA, CDC, HHS, USDA, I'm not really sure at this point, but I think he's he's gunning for something. Let's uh, to both of you, let's just go one level below and look at the uh, important committees that, that deal with health care in the House and Senate. I'm wondering what changes could occur in the new session and maybe to the extent that uh, you have an insight who's jockeying for uh, the role of committee chairs in their respective bodies. Um, I'll speak to the Senate. I think that in terms of the Senate Health Committee, um, if if there is uh, if Republicans take the Senate, I, I think the next in line might be Rand Paul, but he seems to be looking outside of help. He may want to be on other committees. Um, so that would put Senator Cassidy, who's a gastroenterologist from Louisiana, that would put him um, in, as in charge of uh, the help committee as chair there. And I think um, his priorities are a little different than Sanders, but I I think we could see some more of the same discussions. I don't know that he's anywhere. I don't think anyone would be as strong as Sanders in terms of trying to bring down drug prices and is focused on that um, and on you know things like private equity and healthcare. I don't think those are as strong priorities for someone like Senator Cassidy. In terms of finance, the finance committee, um, we could see potentially Mike Crapo um, move up in, in that position. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know as much about the house where, where things would stand there, but maybe there I can speak to other. Well, I, I, I can jump in on the house and, and, and just voice what you said about the Senate. I think that we could probably see Cassidy being the head of the health committee, because as you said, um, Rand Paul seems to have some other objectives and Cassidy is pretty invested on some of these issues on the house side it's already under Republican control. So we can imagine that some of those, you know, chairmanships are going to stay the same, but one notable one is that energy and commerce committee committee, which does oversee a lot of the healthcare industry, a lot of the agencies, um, Kathy McMorris Rogers is retiring. And so we could probably expect that some of her, you know, deputies, someone like Morgan Griffith or Brett Guthrie could be the head of that committee. And I think that's probably one going to be one of the most important committees to watch because that has been the vehicle for a lot of the discussion of public health reform. It's also been the vehicle for a lot of things that have just sort of been shelved sometimes, but still seem to be priorities like, you know, regulating pharmacy benefit managers, drug costs, what happens happens in that realm. And so I think that we can expect in the other House committees that the leadership will generally stay the same. Energy and commerce, a little bit of shuffling up, but they're going to have those priorities in front of them still. Well, maybe a a question for either of you. Maybe we can forget that Congress will actually be back this year for the lame duck session, uh, but there are a lot of issues uh, before it. Certainly includes an issue very important to our audience, the reauthorization and funding of community health centers, uh, but other issues such as telehealth, 
pharmacy benefit managers, other bills. Uh, would you like to do a, a crystal ball on what will happen after November 5th with these issues? I will just say that telehealth, I'm sorry, Sarah. I will just say that I think that telehealth has, they, they need to act uh, on that issue right. quickly. Um, as far as, you know, changes in terms of PBMs and community health centers, um, I, I do think that there's appetite for, for addressing the PBM issue. I just don't know how I, it's, it's, they've been talking about it. I don't know how many hearings Sarah and I have both listened to about PBM reform and explaining over and over all the different players and what the problems are. And I don't know if there's going to be movement, but there could be. Mm -hmm. So but those are my thoughts. Well, Shannon and Sarah, thank you so much for joining us today on Conversations on Healthcare. We remind everyone to vote so your voice is heard. And don't forget to subscribe to our videos on YouTube and find us on Facebook and X with our account name, CHC Radio. As always, you can go online to chcradio.com to sign up for emails, updates. You can also share your thoughts and comments about this program. Again, thank you both for joining us and for your insight uh, into what is uh, about to be settled uh, sometime in November, hopefully before January. <laughs> Take care now. This copyrighted program is produced by Conversations on Healthcare and cannot be reproduced or retransmitted in whole or in part without the express written consent from Community Health Center, Inc. The views expressed by guests are their own and they do not necessarily reflect the opinion of Conversations on Healthcare or its affiliated entities.